I will, of course, of course, of course. Good evening and welcome everybody. There are several new faces here who are here because of Charles and who don't know why we do what, why we do, what we do. So I thought that since you don't know us, I'll introduce the space which is Gyan Prava Mumbai, which seeks to facilitate critical thinking in the arts through courses, lectures, seminars, conversations, and performances, we offer a platform to engage with works and a window to the current works of theory and practice. The objective is to bring about informed dialogue and discussions to enable us to think critical, think art. Since we opened in July 2007, we have presented over 200 public programs and our courses which now which are four in number, have been attended by over 500 participants. Currently, we have about 100 students studying with us. I'm happy to announce a partnership with South Asia Institute of Columbia University, whose faculty will be visiting us and teaching several courses. This partnership will be launched mid-December with Professor Akil Belgrami, who will be conducting a three session seminar, actually six lectures, on secular, secularism, and enchantment. One of our cutting edge initiatives is called Creative Processes, under which we invite practitioners to share their work, their doubts, and impulses, giving us an understanding of the oeuvre in their language, in the first person, unmediated by critics, curators, and historians. Under this rubric, this year, William Kentridge, Shiroze Hushiari, Malavika Sarukai, and Maximo Gonzalez have shared their creative processes to packed houses and critical acclaim. Today, we have the internationally renowned architect and thinker, Charles Correa, who will take us through his trajectory, highlighting his important career markers. The entrance to cave number one at Elephanta has a profound pairing in the form of Yogeshwar Shiva and Natesha Shiva. One still as a flame, an exemplary form of stasis, and the other dancing the cosmos in and out of existence, a dynamis. This stillness and movement is an indicator for the absorption of these two sim experiences simultaneously so that the whole can be sensed. We often see only fragments, but can and do sense the whole. This, to my mind, would be the purpose of architecture, which unfolds frame by frame in space and time. Who better to give us the tools to experience wholeness than Charles Correa, whose principal concerns have encompassed the ritualistic pathway, the empty center, open to sky spaces or non-building, and the overarching principle of architecture as metaphor. Charles's recent exhibition at the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects in London was a tribute to a stupendous career which began in 1958. It also celebrated the creation of the Korea archives after his bequest of about 6,000 models, photographs, and films, the single largest gift by a non-British architect. The Wall of Fame now sports, in its panel of recipients of the Reba Gold Medal, Charles Correa, the only name from India. We have much to be proud of and cherish. Here is an Indian, a Bombaywala, a dear friend, and a aunt amidst us today. Charles will speak about his work and his thoughts, which will be followed by a film titled Into the Unknown, made on his much acclaimed recent creation, Champali Moore Center in Lisbon. A conversation between Sankalp Meshram, the director of the film, and Charles will follow. And I hope that all of us in the audience will have time to interact with this profound thinker after that. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me 
in welcoming Mr. Charles Correa and inviting him to address us. Thank you, thank you very much for all those generous things. Uh, when Rashmi asked me to speak, it was difficult because usually I speak to architects or students of architecture, or otherwise it's a general lecture to the public. Um, but this is the first time I've tried to give such a to uh, talk, which is about what is the process through which we design a building. It's, it's very important, I think, that the public understands. Um, to begin with, I thought rather than speak in generalities, I'll take you through a particular project. But to get to that project, I'll have to try and explain a little bit of the thoughts that went in through my head through the other projects I did on my way there. Now, the first thing I should say is that there's there's a big difference between construction and architecture. We use the word architecture in India very, very loosely. Everything in Gurgaon is architecture. Why is it so bad? You know, there's so much writing done, but is it E.M. Foster? Is it whatever? There's a difference between literature and writing. There's also a difference between construction and architecture, which most civilized cities, if not countries, understand. They don't mix it up, and we do here. And um, I think Corbusier put it very well. He said, the purpose of construction is to hold things together. The purpose of architecture is to move us. And he said even better, more vividly, he said, um, stones are dead things lying in quarries, but the apses of St. Peter's are a passion. That's beautiful. That means you take inert material, like stones, like brick and steel, and you infuse them. You go, you go to Fatehpur Sikh, you go to any of these places, the temple at Kailash, look at the passion in that, in that work and what it takes to put that in. So, having said that, I'll now try and take you through, but I want to put this caveat. When I said all this, I don't mean that architecture is an abstraction, no. A building must work. It has a purpose. All design has a purpose. And this is where we part company with the painters who, if they're, if they're too useful, they feel they, are, they have sold out. <laughs> Picasso, for instance, a, a great sculptor like Noguchi who designed a coffee table. Brilliant. It's a piece of sculpture. They thought less of him, the critics, because Henry Moore would never design a coffee table. You must understand the snobbery that goes on, where artists are considered higher than someone who's actually useful, and especially in the art tradition of craftsmen. Of course, we must open that door. And um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's something we have to think about why, why this happens. Now, so a building must work. There's no question about that. It, must, it has a purpose, and to me at least, it becomes interesting when it goes beyond that purpose, when it expresses something, other, other more metaphysical values. <laughs> Here is the Kund at Modera. You all, all know this. It's about 30 or 40 miles north of Ahmedabad. Has everyone been there? Yeah, it's worth going right now, <laughs> this evening. But it's fantastic. You see, on a, on a practical level, it's just a tank, a water tank. And what's very, very clever about it, of course, is that it's a place for pilgrims to bathe. And as the, as the monsoon, when the monsoon comes, it fills up. But as the, as the dry weather sets in and the water recedes, you, you can perform the same rituals at lower and lower levels. So those steps are not just abstract sculpture. They're tremendously intelligent, functional use. And all these kuns have that quality. So, but then it's much more than that. Even now, I haven't begun to describe it. You know, just to dig into the earth is primordial, to go in search of water. That's what you're looking at. And it moves you, whether you 
think about it or analyze it, some in your deep in your stomach, you know that this is, you know, water is the giver of life. And as someone said, it's the taker of life. It's very basic to us. And then, of course, there's the empty center. So if the, if the, if the temple at Modera is a model of the cosmos, this is like an inverse model of the cosmos into the earth. And now, lastly, it's open to sky. That means you have something which is called the axis of the universe set up between the earth and the sky above which exists in, in everything, going back to the Pantheon, it goes way before that to the, the, the Greeks, to the Pantheon in Rome, you know that building. It exists everywhere. Every, every human culture has imagined this connection between the earth and the sky. That is what urban architecture begins to deal with these issues, but naturally, I don't think you can force it. These people didn't force it. They were just doing something so primordial and so basic that it got this expression. So, so that's really important that a mythic image like this is much, much deeper than just what we seem to see. We are, it stirs in us. Um, it's, it's wonderful. I, there was a chap called Gaston de Bachelard who wrote a brilliant book on, on science. He was a member of the French Academy. And then he wrote one book on art of, at the age of 60. He stopped writing for 10 years. And because art is so different, he said, art, science is cause and effect. He said, art is not cause and effect. You can't say, oh, because that was brown, I made this black. He said, it's like a depth charge which explodes in your subconscious and sends to the surface the debris of recognition. We don't even know why we recognize this, but this is doing so many things to us. Here's another mythic image, the guru in the forest, very basic. It's education, of course. It's the guru and his chelas. It's basic, not just in India, everywhere in Asia, I think in Africa too. Now, the, the symbol of education in North America is the little red schoolhouse. It has totally different implications. First of all, the weather, so they have to close it. But secondly, it has quite a different, I don't know how to say, ambiance. So that, I mean, I know I can get educated here, but I don't know if I can get enlightened. I know under an open sky, you would get enlightenment. And that's what the kund is playing in your mind. It's under God's sky. Now this open to sky space is very, very important in housing because especially at every level, at very rich people want a lawn and this, but really poor people, when they have a courtyard or a terrace, you double the one room they have, they can get two rooms. And it's the second room has this wonderful quality of connecting with other things. So I, at least all the housing I've done, I've tried to use that, rich or poor. You, you have to realize it's, it's primordial, you, it, it's very basic. Uh, what I'm describing is different attitudes which I, you pick up as you go through life. I'm sure that's true of painters and writers and stuff. Um, you know, there's something called uh, the snail. As it moves along, the snail is inching along and then goes this way and then goes that way. And uh, there's a word for that trail. I, I read it once, it's a scientific word. But I forgot it, and no scientist can tell me what it is. But it was a very nice art essay, and it said, if you study that trail, you learn about the snail. So I think artists are like that. You do random things, seemingly random, but slowly they're beginning to form. They're going to form a kind of connecting. So one of the things which I was, and I think all of us in India, we want to find an Indian architecture. We want to know what architecture could be in India. No, our problem is really that all architecture as we know it today, including modern architecture, goes back to this very simple diagram of the Parthenon, which was one of the original icons of Europe, of Greece, as you know. And so the Greeks did not think that man should imitate nature. It wasn't like Art Nouveau where you make leaves and stuff, no. 
a, a, a building is man-made, nature is separate, and you have a dialogue between man and nature. That's essential. In fact, that was followed by the Romans after them. Then came Palladio and the thing, and finally all the way down to Corbusier. Now, if you're a European and you're coming down this road, is this this way or this? I don't know which way this is. Oh, sorry. You're coming down this road and you come all the way to Corb. If to find an Indian architecture, I can't turn left. Or to find Japanese, turn right. I've come down quite a different road than perhaps what exists here. I don't know what exactly that is, but that is what we should search for. But I knew, I know it's not that. In fact, if I see, for instance, the caves in Ajanta, they are not destroying the hill or dominating it, but they're not leaving it alone. It's a very ambiguous relationship, and that's why typically Hindu and Buddhist, that you don't have this simple dichotomy between man and nature and good and whatever, on and on. So I thought to myself, what would happen if you came down such a path? And um, this was the important building bricks in my head, the snail's trail, I mentioned it. And I thought, what would that be? And I thought it would be something more like a non-building, which isn't the object on the hill, but actually on the, on the contrary, it's a kind of energy field you move through. And one of the ones I did long ago in 75 in Bhopal to 81 was Bharat Bhavan where you enter there and there's nothing to see because it's just behind these walls which you walk past. You go down these courtyards. There's a lake out there. You enter and you go down this courtyard and then you can go through into the next courtyard. What has happened to this? Yeah, I think it's not working. Is it working? Try it again. One day I just point. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you got it? Ah, perfect. And you go down and you can go in here and then you can go down and further down. I mean, each of these places, there are these caves. I'm calling them caves. I mean, they're rooms, they're huge rooms, which have different collections of tribal art or contemporary art or of uh, theater, all kinds of things, and workshops. But basically, you're going under open to sky space. And that loosens you up considerably. Th this is a section through it. Oh, sorry, one second. You see, as it, go it goes on stepping down as you go down to the, to the wa water, which is down here. That's the walls you go by. And that's the water ahead of you. So you know where you're going, but you're not work, work, moving towards uh, a, an object. Then if you look into one of these spaces which you can access, some of you, many of you may have been there, then of course you get these collections, and that's a regular exhibition space or museum. But the idea of moving through to me, it was very important. And I just did this intuitively. I'd done it before. Much later, I learned about the production and all the importance of the, the movement through that. Is, of course, the idea of moving around on a, on a sacred, on a ritualistic pathway is basic to all cultures. It's not just in Hinduism. It's not just in the stupa. It's, um, it's in the Kaaba, in Islam. It's in Christianity, the, the, the novenas going around the cathedrals. <clears throat> this is. I put in a small movie clip, so you'll understand that you can't photograph this building. In fact, I think Sankal went to photograph it, and he said, it's, it's empty center. How can you photograph what isn't there? <laughs> Which is really true. How, how do you do that? And that's the trouble in architecture, because what gets publicized and what gets is the image which you can see in a magazine or a newspaper. That means it's basically just a, a pattern. That's going down to the water. But what's nice about this is that it's actually a public garden, and people come there for the garden, and then they go for one or two. We don't have the equivalent in Bombay. We should. They don't even have it in Delhi. Delhi, you have to jump in a car to go to Triveni or something. These people come on a scooter. It's right in the, in the city. Now, 
this idea of the of the ritualistic part, we started with one of my first projects. This is the Gandhi Memorial Museum. I think many of you may have seen it. It's in Ahmedabad. And here we've got the, you can see the roofs there. Then if I take the roofs off, you can see that some of the places are enclosed. Gosh, none of these things work. I'm sorry. Maybe you should pay your rent or something. <laughs> I know. I know. Actually, these are made in China. Okay. But anyway, you can, you can see that. The yellow shows where the units are enclosed with, but uh, for keeping letters and books, etc. But really, it shows you how you can go. This is Gandhiji's life. It was a journey. That's through, the, through Ahmedabad. He came back. The first one was South Africa. And then finally, he's, he gets killed. And then he triumphs. That was his house, as you all know. Okay. Really? Which one? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Not that I need it. But anyway, now you see it's, it's tiled roofs, brick, uh, stone floors, etc. And I tried to use the same thing, but in a contemporary voice. Now I'm going to make a lot of enemies in this room, but I don't think heritage means that you make a cartoon version of the past. That's terrible. You must, you must speak. Am I in the way? No, oh, oh. You, you can't make a cartoon version of the past. If you see what's done in Spain and Italy, wonderful new pieces are added, but very of high integrity, and they complement the old. You've all seen that. It's very sad, the state of heritage here, because people aren't allowed to do that. They've got some committee. <laughs> what did this chap call them yesterday, idiots, who that, that <laughs> CNR Rao? No, I just feel they should think about it because you do need to make some statement about this generation, about the India which existed today. But it's still very austere because that's what Gandhiji's life was. And because of the openness, of course, villagers and all feel very free. They don't have to push open a glass door. So this openness, this open to sky space is very, very important. No. This is a, a very important idea, nothing to do with me. It's the mandala. When we talk about architecture as a metaphor, this is incredible that the city of Jaipur is itself a metaphor for the cosmos, the very plan of it. As you know, a mandala consists, this is the mandala of 81 squares and, and, and uh, 64, etc. But it consists of... Um, all the, and then the center is that is where you have a Brahman, where, where, your, where your soul goes after all moksha. And this fellow, as you know, I mean, many scholars think, so I don't know, I'm not a scholar, that he took the Navagraha, the nine planets, because he was fascinated by the sky. He's the man who built Jantar Mantar. So, and then he took the nine planets and he put it as a city, and then because of a hill, he had to move one planet here. And he kept this for his own, um, what you call it, palace. I thought it was wonderful, you know, that here you're, you're starting a city which is very modern. It's a brilliant city for its time. Yet he has a way of looking back and saying, what can that inform me? Without compromising what he wanted to do. To me, he's the first modern Indian. You know, we should really go back, some scholars should go find out more about him. So when I had to do an um, arts memorial, arts, arts center for Nehru, I thought, well, this is Nehru's predecessor. And I took that same nine squares, except I took this square and pulled it, so you can enter. And by pulling this across, we got access here to the library guru. And then I, I matched each, um, each planet's qualities to something that it's, it was a government building. It had, nothing, it had nothing to do with anything ambitious. I don't think they understood what I was doing. I, you know, the most they ask you, a client usually asks, where's my room? And he was a man, he's a chairman. He says, is there a bathroom attached? <laughs> really, I'm serious. If, you, if you're smart enough to do that, 
You'll get away with this. It's not working. No, it's working. So anyway, but pulling this aside, which is a very contemporary thing to do, gave me access to the mandala. If it had been closed, I wouldn't have been able to design it. It's like rigor mortis. I hate that kind of dead <laughs> symmetry in two directions. It's one thing, anyway, that's what happened. Now, what actually happened, of course, is that you get the planets stacked up one against the other in, in a mandala. And when you look through, you're looking through the center one, which it has to be empty, as I said, that's Brahman. See the way that you connect them, they're thick walls, and then you only have 10 foot by 3 meters by 3 meters opening, and the, the thing itself is 100 feet, 30 meters each planet. So when you look through, you're seeing through several planets. That's a completely different spatial organization than from a conventional, large, monumental public building, which we've done like Vidhan Sabha in, in um, Vidhan Bhava in, in Bhopal. There you put big rooms and small rooms as antechambers and a big one. But I saw that the mandala had a completely different, I said, I must try that. And because it was Nehru, it was a natural good thing to do. What I did find, and I think this chap, uh, Gautam Bhatia has written on this on his own. He said, if you really, in, in any particular um, uh, planet, you're disoriented. What gives you orientation is a glimpse of that empty center. So that made me realize that the, it's not just words. The, the mandala actually was through experience. People understood that an empty space, like a courtyard in the middle of a, build, of a house, and that's in every culture, and this is in a, in, a, in a mandala, it's a much more serious version of that. These things actually work. So that's the center which is empty, which acted as a, the stones, people go, this is the entrance to it. This is the first planet, which is Mangal of Pa. We put the director there, which was a mistake. He was a government director and he gave a lot of trouble. But th this is a nice thing. This is a, this is a giant cosmograph which these were all painted by traditional artists whom Jyotindra got to do the painting. And they were chosen, the symbols and all were chosen by someone called Manu, Manu Desai. Do you know him at all? You should think about He's a wonderful man who was a graphic artist. He had gone to America maybe a little earlier than I did, in the 40s, and he went and studied at Cranbrook. So his work was absolutely contemporary. But his interest went all the way back. So when he heard I was doing this building, he came. I knew him. And he said, look, can I help? And he was wonderful. And then with Jyotindra, they chose the actual, for instance, the, this is Kate, uh, the, the mythic image in Ketu is of, of uh, Krishna. That's the size of a person. So they, they, they had a lot of fun doing that. Now, I'm just showing you these two things. They had nothing to do with my building. But to tell you how beautiful, actually, is our history. These are the nine planets with their auspicious colors as a gouache. I don't think Matisse is at his best, and he's a wonderful painter, but I think he would admire this very much. And this, of course, I think, this is Surya Vanshi, I think, the seven symbols in Udaipur, I saw it. So we use those auspicious colors for each planet but interpreted them, used those colors, because it's a contemporary building. It's nothing to do with, with the, in that sense, it's, when I finished it, they, someone said, oh, you're getting votes for the BJP. It's got nothing to do with the BJP. I was, I, I was trying, this, this is Guru. You can see that. It's a completely contemporary image. But it's based on very old, like, 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 the, like the Kund in, in, um, in Modera. This is the building from the outside. I really like it very much because these are the nine planets and they all got their symbols. And um, for this thing, you know, in the old days, they used to put cloth and bamboo, see the size of a building. And I didn't know whether we should make it uh, 30 meters per side or 27. So they actually made with bamboos. And we went there because as a model of the cosmos, it has to be autonomous. It must have the gravitas of something that relates to the sky and not just to some neighbors. Now, just one last thing I wanted to point out before we get to Champalimo. I've also been very moved 
very, very moved by the brilliance of what people invent, what you may call, well, for housing especially, in all the, in all the villages and stuff and cities and towns, everywhere in the world. This is the, some uh, housing in, uh, houses in, in Hyderabad, Sindh. You know, it's a dry heat, and this, these people have made these hoods which catch the breeze. It's so strong, those loose, that it's driven down into the basement where it's kept in a room full of water, and then it comes up into the house. It's really incredible. You know, Corbusier said a is a house is a machine for living, but he never built something as evocative as this. It's really incredible. And the whole city, to my mind, this is the whole city, it looks like something out of National Geographic, you know? All those little, little birds waiting to be fed. All these beaks open. It's wonderfully evocative. So my early work and the Champalimo Center to some extent is influenced by that. It had to do with creating form which by its very nature, this is some low cost housing which was just a tube house, just 10 feet wide and no doors or windows. You could control everything through louvers, etc. I wouldn't stop on that. Then Hindustan Lever Pavilion in 61, where I was trying to see what would happen if you tried to get the air out through natural flow. Although this kind of architecture has become very a la mode about 10 years ago, but we did this long ago and nothing to do being a la mode. It was just came out of the, the problem. This was a house for a rich mill owner, Ramkrishna. We used the same principles as that tube house, and it's, it was a very nice house. And it had these courtyards, you can see what it is, and it had this top lighting and the fans, and that's as you went through it. So you could control all that. And then, of course, you all know Kanchenjunga, which is again based on, oh man, it's based on the idea of the uh, through ventilation. And, and the way the levels work and the sliding panels that you can cut something off. So I think dealing with the environment, dealing with energy, is much more than building a glass tower and then using low yield glass to get a LEED certificate. If you look at the old architecture, it, the very shape of the building created that. And that was one of the great stimulants to the architect's imagination. And this was true also in the Alhambra in Spain. It's true everywhere in the world. It's, it's dealing with climate, that's one of the biggest. Yeah, this isn't, this is looking across the city. That's the building. Well, now we come at last to Champagne Center. Um, I'd done a building at MIT, I didn't know these people at all, but I'd done a building at, um, at MIT, it was a brain research. And these people wrote and they phoned and then they came out and I met them at MIT. I didn't know who they were, but they are wonderful people. I'll talk about the importance of the client. The client has to, you have to build a bridge because architecture, like, like painting, is a, is a risk. It's not a very safe thing. If you go to Corbusier, you don't know what you'll get. Maybe unusable. And so you need a client who wants to be on the cutting edge. And what worked very well for us in India in the 60s was wonderful clients like like I think, well, uh, Pupul Jaika, Gautam and Gira Sarabhai, uh, Kasturbhai Lalbhai. These are all people who wanted to be on the cutting edge. And if you look at the history of the 19th or 20th century in Europe, you'll find the same in painting and architecture. That is what has gone out. Today you've got market forces run by people who have no idea. All they want to do is make a profit. The last thing they want to be on the cutting edge of anything except the profit. They never see any other aspect that is quite different. And I think that allowed architects of my generation to grow. And I really feel that is something we should do because no building is better than the client who commissions it. Well, anyway, this was the, this was the site. This is the site, this is the river. When they told me they have a site on that river and just at that point where Vasco da Gama left for India, I'd seen it and I thought that's a wonderful place to do a building. Now when I got there, it was raining and the site was locked. 
So I had to walk in the evening, and I had to walk along here with the, with the client. And I was trying to see where the river becomes the ocean. And all the time, Jean Botelho, he kept telling me, just around the corner, just around. And we never found it because it was raining. So that's like what it was. But I'm very lucky I didn't get to see it because I went to sleep that night. I felt I must do something which connects the point of entry with that unknown. Because it's very, very important that the courage you need to go into the unknown, which is really what we talk about people, this research and cancer and brain disease, it's tremendous adventure for the people, the doctors, the scientists, the patients. So and my first thing was this, but in the, in the 15 minutes I realized that's not going to work because on this side there's already a curved, what in earth is happening here? Anyway, uh, you see that curved wall, that curved walk, there, there is no, uh, what is that? No. Oh, yeah, it is. this one's come back. <laughs> <laughs> Life in the mysterious Orient. But anyway, <laughs> this is the curve, and you can't, this is a public space. We want to make this a public space. So I said we should have three walls, and then you get, of course, a connection. And that's what the project is. The buildings are behind that wall, and there's a glass bridge connecting them. The third building, the Unit C, is a small amphitheater which is given to the city to use. But also all this public space was given back to the city. We've used less than 50% of the site. And again, the client backed me on that. I said, it's too important a site to make it your foundation. And it was very good because when they started construction, of course, lots of NGOs came around. But they were disarmed and they were told, you've now got a site which celebrates the history before it was just rubbish and nothing there. So that's, that's what the three buildings look like. And that's the entrance and that, that's the way you come in and go there. And I'll just show you a fly through. There's the ocean out there. What's very nice in simulation, we don't design on the computer, but it's very useful for doing things like this so that you can check and also the client can understand what, the, what you're trying to do. So now all the spaces of the building are lit, lit through different gardens, very much like the Alhambra. From the outside, you see these walls. But on the inside, it's a quite a different world. So it does, this building doesn't look like the Alhambra, but the principle is the same. That's very important to my mind. You use the same principle, perhaps, but you reinvent its expression. Now we've come out between the two buildings. There's the glass bridge. And now we're walking up towards the ocean. And I felt this is into the unknown. So I sloped this thing. I put the parking under. Because I feel you must see the sky, you mustn't see water. The sky is the real unknown, not water. When you come to the end, you see water, and then you see an enigmatic object, which might be an island or whatever, a Portuguese man of war, whatever it is, but it's what you came in search of. And then th this is all the laboratories and the, the research, etc. That's looking back. Yeah, you can see some of the gardens and how they're placed. This is the, the uh, service area, but the service area also is part of the sculpture. I think, I think architecture is sculpture, but with the gestures of human occupation. It's not just stupid abstract sculpture. No, it's got to do, if you look at a great house by Frank Lloyd Wright, the windows don't make it less sculptural, make it more so. The openings, the shadows. This is the glass bridge, done by a German engineer, brilliant man. It got, so now here, here, are the, here are the plans and you can see the, the different buildings and the stuff. 
And then, of course, all the studies we had to make to try and understand what would be the way and what would you look at. And that's where Google Earth comes in very useful because you can zoom in seriously. Then you can see what happens across the, the river and what view you would get. And of course, even from those openings. And then the building starts to go up. This whole thing was done in three and a half years, including construction. And it's a huge thing. It's twice as big as the MIT building. But because of this very good, trusting relationship between the architects and the clients and everyone else, the doctors, it's very, very important. See, an architect, I think Monica is weaving, and once Akbar was telling her, Akbar Padamsi, the painter, he said, you know, when you paint, you want to make a, a curve. Then you don't like it, you erase it. He said, you can't do that in weaving. <laughs> It's true, you have to rip it all out and go back. So that gesture, spontaneous gesture, how do you make it? Because you can't get it wrong. And in, in architecture, of course, it's to do it at the right scale. And, and when I saw this going up, I said, well, at least we got the scale right. So th this is that space down the center. And there it's going towards the river. And this is what we're trying to make out of it trying to give it definition, shape, and, and drama. I'll just go fast through these things. You can. And the whole thing is like, I think it's like cheese, you know, you just chop it with a very sharp knife, scalpel. We also put the stones, only use flat stones. And when it was more of a curve, we use them shorter, because I love the way stones, when they're not curved, they reflect the sun and all unevenly. This is from the entrance side. This is looking into this garden, which hopefully will become a Brazilian rainforest. This is right at the begin beginning. These this is the entrance to the building. This is both buildings with the bridge between them. And uh, just this curve is enough to give you the protection you need for arrival. You don't have to have a, a column with a porch or anything like that. It's all that's looking through for more. Because it's very important to see the, ski, the sea and the sky, as I said, as therapy. I think we, we have an ability to help cure ourselves. It's not all medicine. It's got to do with looking at nature, too. Yeah, this, this is the therapy um, courtyard. Now, I just thought I'd show you some of these, which is how you connect these spaces. Because we've got such simple gestures, you must have moments where it's quite rich. You know, you go from one to another. Oh, this is wonderful. This, for the opening by the president of Portugal, um, the, the president of the foundation, Leonor, she climbed up on a chair and wrote this with a, with a felt pen or whatever that marker is called. But it was like Picasso or something, you know. I never, she didn't have any plaque. All they did on this concrete, they wrote, this is the foundation, I mean, the completion, open by. See, this shows you how you go up. And of course, this end of the building is facing the, the ocean, so it's absolutely open. It's like, like binoculars looking out, like a tele periscope out to sea. This is the service entrance. I like the way the sunlight comes through. And look at the scale. I mean, because of the, if this had been flat walls, it would have been deadly. But because of the curved wall, there's a very, they, they sit on the ground very easily, very lightly. This is the bridge, which is a brilliant piece of engineering, I think jewelry, I'd call it. This is looking back towards the city. So the city also plays a part, and it's, it's seen like that. And of course, the stone has different colors at different times of the day. There's Belenta. Now we're just walking. This is just the last section. As you walk towards the end, I wanted to put two monolith um, granite columns, 60 feet. They said they could get 18 meters high granite. And they got it, but they couldn't transport it from, this, from the quarries down to Lisbon because of the roads and stuff. So we finally did this in concrete, but using blue concrete at the top. So there's a wonderful way they melt into the sky. This is from the amphitheater. This is walking towards the end. 
There you can see that island. It's what you go and search of. Thank you.